of, of the uh, of the of our branch committee. A lot of people still don't know me. Uh, it's, it's Keith Emerson. I've been with you a couple of years now. Delighted that so many people have come and joined this our branch uh, meeting by video. It's our second one we've done. So absolutely delighted that somebody's taken the opportunity to come along with us on this one. And thanks, Simon, indeed, for being the host who sets it all up. He's a technical man. Like everybody else, I just click the button and hopefully I'll come along there as well. So with no further ado, can I just welcome Dawn, who actually come along to, to talk to us from Switzerland. I'm going to say no more on that and go on to Ruth Herman. And Ruth's going to give us a and tell us a little bit about, about Dawn and where we go from here. Dawn, uh, uh, Ruth, over to you. A few of you know Dawn already from when she was at the University of Hertfordshire helping um, guiding the dance classes with along with Lucy and Becky. Uh, since then she's gone to Switzerland, the land of chocolates and clocks. <laughs> but she, she went as a researcher. Um, she's now, I think, internationally acclaimed, can I say? Because <laughs> you've got lots of international contacts. So internationally acclaimed researcher. She's an expert on music and managing music movement and mood in Parkinson's. She's a, a, a neuropsychologist. A music psychologist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, not only that, she's also a professional drummer and has taken an, an arts council fund, which is, which is fantastic in itself, to get arts council funding for anything. An arts council funded programme around the country, I think, and internationally. Have you been abroad with it? Yes, we've, uh, well, we've had lots go. of our gigs cancelled, though. So. Oh, well. But anyway, so now you have a superstar talking to you today. So I'm going to leave it to Dawn. Over to you. Ta -da. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's really lovely to see so many familiar faces and um, to be able to sort of share this cycle of the research when I'm sort of saying, okay, this is what we did. This is what we found out. And this is now hopefully what we're planning to do. So um, I'd like to take the opportunity today. Oh, where's my cursor gone? to think a little bit and talk to you a little bit about sound music and the brain and how we can use music to help manage movement and mood for people with Parkinson's, but how we can do that better by doing co-research. That's often known as PPI or public and patient involvement in the research process, but also a whole range of other types of researchers. So really taking a multidisciplinary approach. And there's been a paper published actually for uh, neurologists and practitioners recently saying that this is a really important way forward um, for Parkinson's research and to try to make sure that we can optimize care for people with Parkinson's by working with them, not just for them or researching on them. Um, so I'll take you through a little bit about the thinking behind what we've done together and how and what I'm working on at the moment and hopefully trying to get funding on because I'd really appreciate your feedback on that process. So starting with sound, it's really an incredible and very underrated sense. Um, it's created by the interaction of an event and an object that results in a pressure variation in the air. So here's a trusty drum that I have, if I strike it, the way that we hear that is the traveling air pressure hits our eardrum and then basically the physical energy is transduced into electrical potentials that are kind of, um, I guess, tickle the different hair cells in the cochlea to different rates. And then that goes up the auditory nerve into the brain and it's tonotopically mapped. So the different frequencies that we hear at with, within our cochlea is mapped onto different areas of the brain. So that's how we understand what different frequencies are, but also we can use sound in lots of different ways. Um, uh, and and the, basically the brain's role is to try and interpret what the sounds are. So it kind of gets processed quite a lot before it gets up there. So, Though sound is mostly processed in our temporal lobes, it actually is amazing how um, many connections there are to other areas of our brain. And this is where it's really important for um, understanding how we can use it in Parkinson's care. So it's especially strongly linked to our motor system, but also to our limbic system. So that means sound can help us to move, but it also helps us to understand and communicate feelings. Um, and they actually work together sometimes. So if we think about the fight or flight response, 
then we have like a really, we can subconsciously almost react to sound. So we will, before we're kind of aware that we're hearing something, if we perceive a sound that's a threat, then we can move without having to think about it. And this works through um, the amygdala and in the limbic system. So we can see an example of this here with these crazy cats. And they are gonna be um, displaying what we would call a startle reflex. So what they're basically doing is assessing the, the, their environment and trying to understand if this metronome is a threat to their um, existence. So you could see the cats jumping every time there was a noise that they didn't understand, they couldn't interpret it. And so they had this kind of startle response. But we also use sound in lots of ways to understand the context of our environment. So whether it's safe, for example, and this apparently is the most soothing sound to the human brain. So that's known as the babbling brook and that's used in neurofeedback to calm the brain's activity. But we also need to know when we do have a threat. So sitting in our living rooms, this, the next sound I'll play isn't very threatening, but if we were camping in the Serengeti, it might be. So sounds have different properties that make us react in different ways. And quite often that sort of low sound comes from a very big kind of animal or, um, um, a, a kind of booming voice is, is really used to convey danger or anger and we hear that reflected in music and in speech when we shout we tend to well sometimes we can go high but we often tend to have a more booming voice and this conveys a sense of danger so we're really using sound to communicate it's not just about the words that we're saying although they are very important it's about the intention and the way that we're saying it so um, we've developed a kind of particular um, way of communicating using sound that become, can become very complex, as well as a simple sound like a baby crying to get attention because it needs something. We can have all sorts of other abstract ways of communicating with sound. And one of the strangest and most abstract of those is music. Now, some people think that music developed as um, a precursor to speech and that much of what we hear in, in music is a, a way of conveying emotions. But as we'll see, other people think about it quite differently. So a very famous uh, scientist, Steven Pinker, suggests that music is actually auditory cheesecake. And that is that rather than an adaptation that has some kind of evolutionary value, it is an exaptation, so something and like an added extra that our brain can do because it's overdeveloped and it's a way that we can amuse ourselves because we have a sort of bonus pack, if you like. Whereas other people think that actually music is a defining characteristic of humanity. And the fact that we keep doing it means that it serves some purpose that we don't quite fully understand. And there are very few animals that actually engage in musical behavior in the way that we do. And the only animals that seem to do are animals that are doing it for either mating reasons or social reasons. So I'm going to play you a little clip of a very famous now cockatoo, cock, cockatiel, parakeet actually, called Snowball. And this is really brings together the idea of how music works in a social and emotional way. And I'll, I'll play it to you and then I'll explain a bit more.
know, I'm just pausing it there for a sec because I just wanted to explain that although it is very, it's great to see how this animal is engaging with the music and that it seems to be when the music gets faster because it can't quite move at the right speed in the same way, it has to adjust its movements and adapt. And that's really important. But what was also important about the experiments that they did with Snowball was that Snowball had really learned this as a social interaction. So they did this experiment where they had Snowball's owner wearing some headphones and listening to music that was of a completely different nature. And they just said to, to her, you have to move according to the music that you're listening to. And Snowball will be hearing some different music. And we want to see whether Snowball's interacting with you or with the music. And um, I haven't got the video of this, but it was really interesting because Snowball was watching its owner and trying to move in time with its owner. But the auditory feed that Snowball was getting was different. And it became so frustrating that actually Snowball had to turn around, let Snowball's self, I'm not sure if it's a she or a he bird, um, move in time with the music that Snowball was hearing. And then when it had sort of got it out of its system, it could turn around and interact with its owner again, and it would re-engage with the system, with the movement that the owner was doing. So these are two sort of central ideas of how sound and music affect our auditory and or, or motor and limbic systems. And now we're going to move on to thinking about how those have been used to help people with Parkinson's, not just for their movement, but also in their mood. So first of all, the mechanistic kind of qualities of it. Um, our brains have been described, uh, not that recently anymore, um, by Clark as, a, as proactive predictivores. Obviously that's not, there is no such thing as a predictivore. I just made a little dinosaur picture that I thought might be quite good um, to explain that. But really we're searching out and hunting for patterns to enable us to understand our environment. And even if we're not gonna have that startle reflex, we can use all of the signals that we get, some of them visual, some of them tactile, but a lot of them auditory, to be able to predict what's going to happen. Um, and these are the organizational properties of music. Of course, music has melody, but it also has rhythm. And it's the rhythm that helps us organize time through music. Um, these like really predictable patterns are really important for people with Parkinson's because music is a whole brain experience, whereas the kind of word system, the speech system is a very small area of the brain in comparison. So what it's thought, although it hasn't been proved, this is still a theory, is that music acts as a sort of compensatory mechanism, uh, enabling um, people with Parkinson's to use different parts of their brain to overcome the problem that's in the basal ganglia. And, and so it can recruit, for example, more systems to the cerebellum, like a tiny part or small part of the brain that's involved in movement planning. Um, so we use these predictable patterns as sort of temporal scaffolding and we entrain to them to step in time. And based on this kind of neuroscientific evidence about how the neurons in the brain fire in time to music and can engage with music, then um, there's a process um, or type of therapy called neurologic music therapy, where they use music as a specialized stimulus um, to kind of create effective therapeutic strategies. And the most famous of these is called rhythmic auditory stimulation that's used for people with Parkinson's. So I'll just play you an example of it here. Okay, left up now. Left up. Okay. I'll save you from the rest of the awful German singing that happens next, but I think you get the idea of it. So when I was um, at Hertfordshire, we were really looking at which aspects of it were in other types of movement were important for, for engaging with the, this, this rhythmic aspect of music. And we did some experiments with stepping in time. So instead of locomotion and moving forward, just stepping up and down on the spot. And we found that exactly the same thing existed. In fact, people were much better at stepping in time with the music than they were, for example, just tapping their finger to the music. 
So there was something about this kind of whole body movement that made people engage with the music really easily. Um, One of the other aspects about um, doing the research with the dance for Parkinson's was thinking about, well, which, which aspects were working on the mood? And this came, came down to the socialization. So we saw earlier with Snowball the parakeet that really needed to interact with other people. And so these are some of the theories about how it improves people's mood or quality of life. And there are a few different ideas around that. So that might be one of those is called sensory motor empathy. And this is the idea that if we have shared goals and we're trying to achieve something together, we have more of a feeling of understanding of what the other person is doing. So they're less threatening and we're trying to basically um, form a cohesive group. Um, a similar idea is embodied social, social synchronization, although that's been used more for ideas like how do we get people to row together? How do we get people to um, do war dances together? And there's another idea called shared affective motion experience or the same model, which is where they're really talking about how certain types of brain cells called mirror neurons um, mean that we can learn how, how to adjust our own behavior based on just by looking at other people. And so this is known to happen in, in how animals learn. Um, it's a little, people aren't still sure about it in humans, but it's definitely one of the aspects that it's not just about moving in time and locking into that rhythm and that sensory motor synchronization. It's about moving in time together and the social aspects of it. So at Hertfordshire, we did lots of patient and public involvement or PPI work. We had an advisory committee and group, and we also had the Dance for Parkinson's group. Um, and we really learned how important it was to include people in, in the research and, and to not, um, a lot of people find it very difficult to get people to come and take part in their research, but that's because it's always about people feel like it's always about what's wrong with them rather than about, well, what can we do to actually help ourselves? So that was what we did with the, um, the dance class. It was really trying to work together to get something that was beneficial to everybody um, and look at how different types of movement to music and the social aspects of dancing could help. And um, some people really liked it as this clip, clip shows. Dancing makes me feel free. More and sometimes, if I'm really lucky, it untangles me, like I was a puppet with all my strings mixed up and they all come back into the right places. Um, so it makes me feel free. So there's something there about the music and the movement and doing it together that was very freeing, that was almost like a, you didn't have to think too hard about the movement. And we wanted to look into more ways about that people use um, music to help them get by. I know that there's one person who uses um, a famous song, Nelly the Elephant to cross the road, for example. And other people have told us sort of anecdotally how they think about music to get them down to the paper shop and, and to, to get the things. But it, the things that they want to do, but it hasn't really been kind of systematically studied. So we won um, a small grant, uh, a Parkinson's network grant, to bring together people with Parkinson's to work with a group of interdisciplinary scientists. So we had sports scientists and psychologists, music, dance psychologists, neuroscientists, and we sort of did a lovely like two day workshop where we worked together and sort of everyone said why they were coming, what they wanted to get out of it. And we, I paired different researchers up with different people with Parkinson's, discuss how they used music, what were the problems that they had um, discovered when they were doing research, how, how to ask advice on how we could fix these problems with the people with Parkinson's really as a two-way research process. Um, and it, it was really lovely and it resulted, oh, sorry, it resulted um, scientifically in this basis expert statement paper, which Lucy is also on. Um, and this was a lovely piece of work, which really said, this is the state of play and what we know at the moment, which isn't really enough. We know that if we look at this infographic, that music is a kind of social glue, it can connect people. We know that music can be very stimulating. Um, Costas, the lead author, calls this something like an ergogenic effect. So that means that when we exercise with music at the right kind of tempo, we can exercise for longer or we don't mind exercising because we don't feel so much fatigue. 
one or the other, and that music is associated with very positive memories or music and movement. So this often happens in things like, um, because we have weddings and kind of very emotional social functions. And then we associate the music at the time with, um, with the movements that we were doing. And Kelly Jakubowski up at Durham University has just completed a study showing that actually older people have more positive memories associated with music. So this is something that we can also use. Obviously, we have the kind of more mechanistic effects so that we know that music can be used for entrainment and we can lock in to those specific types of um, like rhythms in the music. But one thing that we haven't yet really looked at is music for relaxation. Quite a lot of studies have shown that um, music can be used to, for example, slow your heartbeat. And then the next study comes along and shows that actually music will raise your heartbeat and it could be exactly the same music. So it seems that we all have a very idiosyncratic physiological response to music. And we need to learn more about how to do that in the future. The other thing that came out of the workshop, the, the Parkinson's UK workshop, was a drum circle study. Oops. And we, we talked with people who maybe didn't like dancing so much, but wanted to try other things. Um, we talked to them about, well, what kind of things would you like to try? Obviously, I'm a drummer, so I was slightly biased towards doing a drum circle. But we thought, well, we'll try it and we'll see how it works. And if you can see here, these little bobbles are what we call the reflective markers. And what we were trying to do is see, can we think about doing something like this and and helping people learn how to synchronize and how to control their movements. So I'll show you first of all the kind of things that we were doing. And then the way that we were trying to record it with these markers, oops, it sort of looks like this. This is just a projection of it onto the wall. I'm sorry, it's not better quality. So all of those little markers on people's arms are basically being picked up by infrared cameras. And then we can basically analyze the, that as data later to see if training, for example, improved people's range of movement, their ability to synchronize, um, and try and think about what kind of aspects of the drum circle were helpful. Um, and also we were trying out different types of um, uh, way of, ways of thinking about measurement. So often people, when they do experiments with actual activities, they just measure something before and then afterwards. And then if people have become tired, then it always looks like nothing much happened during the, or, you know, like nothing actually happened. They just got tireder. So we actually took some measures of um, people's affective states or their moods during the actual um, the actual activity as well and what we found was a really nice u-shaped curve which showed that if people were here at the beginning then during the activity they felt much more positive but then at the end of the activity it went down to how they had felt before so we could see that doing the activity was actually effective rather than just two points that didn't seem to change um, so throughout this process, we kept referring back to the work that we, um, the data that we had from the workshop and the feedback from doing this to try and think about, well, how can we develop a new and better intervention that will be really effective? And so we did some more interviews with people, with the people who took part in this. And we ended up with a sort of list of five, five kind of key aspects that we have to remember when trying to come up with, with new interventions. And one was that the range of activities has to be targeted to really useful everyday skills. So for example, doing the drumming, these kind of small movements, it was kind of interesting, but it wasn't actually going to be that helpful. People wanted to do much bigger movements. They wanted to do walking and dancing and practicing how to turn. How can we use music to help us do these functional actual aspects of life that we need help with? And they didn't just want to use one drum, they wanted to use a range of percussive instruments and all sorts of different instruments and their voices. 
But they also felt that in most interventions, there's never any periods of rest integrated. So they thought it was really important that we make sure that whatever is programmed, that we actually have specific time points for resting and to learn about something new. So to learn about rhythm and music from around the world so that you don't feel like you're being you one doesn't feel like one's being therapized and that you're there to kind of rehabilitate, which is um, a word that most people said they really hate it. The other aspect of it was this kind of internalization of music. So um, people, this is called musical imagery, and this is partly to do with remembered music, but also imagined music. And people um, said things like, well, actually, the, what they were listening to was really important. If it was just a metronome, then it was really like a shadow inside their heads, but they could keep singing along with the music. So actually we did some analysis on this and it seems like it was the familiarity of the music that was important more than whether people liked it or not because they hadn't heard the music that we um, had actually played them beforehand and the type of movement was important so people, uh, one person said i just let my body do the movement it felt natural and when i knew the song it was easy to keep it going inside my head so we need to do a lot more research to understand how people with Parkinson's are using musical imagery. And we are conducting that research now with um, uh, an online study with some of the people at the network and also a person at the Royal um, Northern College of Music who, um, who wants to look at this particular aspect of internalized music. But the aim for me is that we actually train, we specifically train music from an external cue source to an internalized cue source so that people can develop their sort of internalized jukebox. And then you can access music whenever you want to or need to. And this is particularly important for when people freeze to be able to overcome that freezing, to think of a song that means, means something um, that you can access to then start and training your mo movement to. And there's been some studies that have shown that although imagining music uses many of the same brain parts as listening to music, actually there's one specific difference, which is an area called the pre-supplementary motor area. And this is very important for switching abilities. And so this is why I think it might be a really um, good thing to try and train for people with Parkinson's so that you can really adapt to the environment rather than the RAS walking, which is quite robotic, really. And of course, that's very helpful. But we also need to kind of um, learn more about how to use music for adaptive kind of functional movements. So the idea I have at the moment is um, is called Songlines for Parkinson's. And this came as a result of really processing all of the research that we've done with people with Parkinson's, as well as the different types of um, kind of artistic work I do. And, um, and at one of the concerts that I do for the Arts Council, it's a storytelling, it's actually using storytelling, using music to tell stories. And somebody said to me, had I written, re sorry, read this book called Songlines by Bruce Chatwin, which I hadn't. But it was all about how Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island peoples use musical stories to navigate time and space. So I thought, well, this is really interesting. This brings together the ideas that we've got from the PPI research of how people with Parkinson's want to learn to use music. And, um, and if we can try and put these things together, then people will have their own story. And it's we can do it in a group, but it's also very individualized. So people can have their own song. And I'm sure you all have your own song that you use anyway, but this is like a sort of systematic training to try and get people to learn how to listen to the underlying beat in music, because it became clear that this, um, that this is something that you train as, as a mu musician, but it's not something that's automatic for a lot of people. Um, so this is my kind of development sessions, um, workshops that I've got. And this brings together the idea of music um, for movement and socialization aspects. So the introductory session would be, and um, this would be for working between people, people of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders in Australia and people with Parkinson's. So the idea is that you, you have an introductory session to share your lived experience. So how, how are people navigating? What are the problems for them? Not trying not to assume anything and just learn about, well, you know, learn about each other's ways of actually tackling these and these strategies. 
and then thinking about music and emotion and how we can connect through music. So this is an idea called copathy, or I guess similar kind of idea as social empathy. And that is that through sharing meaningful songs, we can um, explain a little bit about ourselves. So um, in the workshop we did um, actually shared some of our music and it was really fascinating and amazing how people had their own personal anthem songs, but also people were using music for cathartic experience to sort of let their tears out or to, I don't know, feel sad when they needed to feel sad. And this had a lot to do with the changing identity as a result of Parkinson's diagnosis or different aspects of people's lives that were changing. So this was a kind of um, more of a sort of emotional aspect of music. The auditory perception is about training list listening skills to interpret sounds and track rhythms to understand which ones are helpful in the environment. And then the active rhythmic engagement is really music production skills. So using all the different types of instruments to make different sounds and to understand how our body can engage with that. Then a bit about tempo and repetition. So finding the right speed for you. Everyone has their own spontaneous motor tempo and Lucy and I um, published a paper recently about this and how with people with Parkinson's research, all we ever hear about is that everyone's walking is slower, but we actually checked people's spontaneous tempo with different types of movement. And we found that with finger tapping, actually their tempo was faster. So we can't just assume that everything has slowed down. Different movements have different speeds. And it depends which particular skill you want to train. And then you can adjust the music to train that in a certain way. So with the RAS therapy, they were using, for example, slower um, or faster types of, of um, tempo beats in the music to either extend the steps or to slow down festination, those kind of aspects. Then we can also really train our sensory motor synchronization skills. So learning how to coordinate with, with sounds and also what happens in between the sounds. Not everybody can track a beat and feels like they want to move exactly to that beat. Some people like to move in between the beat. And we, when we dance, we dance in different ways. Our hands might move different than our legs or our bodies. And if we want to think about training things like trunk rotation, we need to think about how we can syncopate with the music, not just do everything exactly in time because that would also be quite boring. Then we need to think about the exact cueing strategy. So what makes us move when, where and why and how that's different for different people. And then to how to internalize those cueing strategies. So use these kind of musical mnemonic skills um, for, for everyday life. And then, of course, the end bit is to reflect and consolidate. So at the moment, I'm trying to get funding for this. The um, Swiss government has put out a call for a weird grant called Practice to Science, where they're looking for people who have a sort of background in one thing, but want to put it into good use for science. So I'm hoping that my background as a musician and as an artist and now as a scientist that hopefully that they will um, help me get the funding to continue the work that we started at Hertfordshire. Of course, none of this happens on its own. So there's a big team of people, lovely people involved, including many of you and many of the Dance with Parkinson's group. And we're really lucky to have had such a, a positive collaborative team. And I'm carrying on the work with Caroline at the moment with the motion capture. We're hoping to do a little bit more work there. And of course, lovely Lucy, who you all know. And we've published quite a lot of papers now. Um, this is just in the last year. Uh, so um, it's a really exciting time and hopefully um, the ideas that I've put forward are something that you will be able to feedback if I'm going in the right direction, if this is something that you would like me to do. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Dawn. Sorry, I, I, was, I was on mute there, but I've, I, I unmuted myself. Um, I expect there's some questions. Uh, I, I, I've got one. Um, I was wondering, just to ask everyone here, how, how, um, how often you actually use music to help your Parkinson's. Um, I know, for example, that June and, and, and her husband were very uh, keen dancers at the Hertfordshire um, session. And I was just wondering if I have a show of hands who actually does some of the 
movement to music classes. So should we have a, a quick show of hands, see how, see how important it is for people? I think that's most people actually with Parkinson's. So um, it just shows how important it is. Um, so the question, the question I have as well, sorry, was um, uh, who else uses music to get started? Do, do, do people use music to get started? Because I, I know you mentioned the importance of music and do people think of a certain tune or, or is, is, is it just any tune that comes in, in, into your head to kind of get you, get you up and going? So may, maybe someone could answer that if, if you want to join the, join the conversation. Um, I think you have to unmute people, Simon. Yes, I will. Sorry. Simon. Yes. Okay. Um, let me unmute people. I wonder if I can do unmute all. Here we are. Un unmute all. Right. Okay. You, you should be you should be able to answer now. With me, it isn't a single tune or piece of music. It's um, a succession of earworms. Um, Extremist earworm is, you know, you wake up in the morning, you've got this music in your head, and you can't get rid of it all day. Or you might get rid of it in ten minutes if you're lucky, but um, it isn't with me a, a single song that I've heard. There's a huge range of about thirty or forty of them. Did Did you have the radio on in the morning, then, Hillary, to kind of help wake you up to, to motivate you to, to kind of you know? Um, yeah. Some morning you get up and there it is, already active. You know. It's on most of the night <laughs> on the classic FM. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's not quite the same. No, I know it's not. It's not your own choice. And would, and would you say, is there a, a particular tune or song? I know you said about 40 different ones, but is there one you think, right, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go for that one today, or is it usually the same one? If it's wrong, I really like her. I'm happy with it all day. I like the Marseille, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, do, I, do you know what an earworm is? Sorry, David. Just say that again, David. Sorry, I couldn't quite hear you. you know what an ear, I know what an earworm is. <laughs> there are other people. <laughs> I've got a question for Dawn. Do you find that different nationalities have different music tastes and move to different things? Yes, they're very keen on out pawns here. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that the kind of musical tastes reflect the instruments of the country. So there's quite a lot of different sounds, um, but also there's been some research on how the sounds of music reflect the sounds of language. So for example, French music is quite distinctive from German music and some kind of linguists have like tried to do some like musicology analysis <coughs> and found that there are patterns in the speech that will also occur in the music that are different, for example, than, than um, British English. Mm. So it's, it's actually, you can get it, you can, rather be European, you can actually can bring it down to nationalities, you know, individual nationalities. It's not, it's not quite so straightforward because yeah. obviously there's so much uh, sort of, uh, mm. you know, plethora of, of Western music and mm. radio. I mean, everybody listens to British pop here. Um, there is not quite so much of a Swiss. Um, <laughs> so there's not so many famous Swiss composers. Um, if, and I say that being at, <laughs> at like the most like, a, a famous a, school. It's <laughs> also influenced what, how you want to listen to or what you want to listen to. A younger person may have different ideas of what they like to listen to than somebody mm. a bit uh, older ages like me. It's absolutely. Pers all the music studies have shown that really we react to what pers our personal preferences mm. are, that we can't do a one-size-fits-all music. Mm. Because also our bodies are all different and we all move differently. So finding that right connection between which song works for you is really important. So, Dawn? Can I ask you something? Hi, Graham. Hi, Yvette. <laughs> Can you, uh, have you ever tried uh, comparing yodeling that they do in Switzerland? <laughs> <laughs> you can actually do a degree in yodeling at my new university. No. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Down this way, you have a lot of interest there, Graham. Have you, uh, can you do yodeling? Are you proficient at it? 
Uh, I did see a Yordle uh, delivery van going past the other day. <laughs> <laughs> well done. <laughs> but the, the question I was going to ask you, Dawn, was that last slide you put with all the different sections going through. It, it, there was a lot, a number of things on there that seemed to lead not only through the music side but dancing as well. Have you got the absolutely and in, there? The, in the intervention that I'm trying to create? I'm trying uh -huh. to use a few different frameworks. So there, so there are some. King and Horrock have published a really good um, conceptual framework for physiotherapists, which has lots of great exercises but no music. And then Costas has his music and sport um, kind of framework where he talks about like how music can be used for motivation, but, but he hasn't really applied that yet to special populations. Um, and there have been many different approaches to doing interventions for people with Parkinson's, but they haven't been very systematic in terms of what are we actually trying to train and why, except for the RAS therapy, which is highly effective, but it's only one skill. So I'm really trying to look at how we can use not just um, music for walking, but dancing, how we can incorporate, you know, Merrill did some great work um, looking at how to incorporate different kind of turning exercises. Yes. Um, but as you know, the only way that things get funded is if we can kind of test a hypothesis really kind of <laughs> get empirical it. science and so we need to really build this framework into um, understanding what's the most effective it can still be individualized but what are the most effective strategies that people can do how can we help them learn how to do those and this is the new aspect of it is the is using earworms or it, this internalizing music process because it's great that the external cueing works having this beat that you can track but it's not very safe to go out into the world wearing headphones for example and having to listen to that and then not attend to all the other environmental dangers that are going on and if we can have something that we take with us all the time like this, these are our kind of our internalized jukebox then if we get stuck and we freeze then we can use this to try and like just kind of access those memory banks. And the reason it's so important that these are, um, they're called music evoked autobiographical memories or memes, um, is because these occurred in what's called a reminiscence bump. So between the ages of 10 and 30, or 18 to 24, depending on who you read, we have this um, particular kind of associative memory of things that we consider to be really good in our lives. And that's why, you know, we all have our own music that we love from a particular era. And people's children go, oh, your music is horrible. And then we go, oh, your music is horrible. Yeah, because it was it. basically this particular period of development that things became important. And of course, this happened before, um, I mean, we, obviously we know that most symptoms of Parkinson's occur after actually the process has begun, but for most people, the reminiscence bump happened way before that even. So if we can really kind of engage with those um, musical memories, then I think that we have something that, that we can carry with us and that it's free and it's part of our identity mm -hmm. that hasn't been damaged. Um, mm -hmm. So that's, that's why I'm going sort of down that road. And it's, and it's drug free as well, so even better. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yes, brilliant. Hi, Dawn. Hi. Hi. Hello. It's a lovely talk. Thank you. Thanks, Lucy. I, I love the idea. How long it was in the end. I'm sorry if I went over time. Yeah. Oh, that was great. That was, love it the was idea under stories of following a story and so on. And um, the idea, am I right? Sort of the idea of linking that to a functional improvement. Is the idea then that they use a jukebox in the head and a learnt task to to work with a particular problem, particular movement or something? Is Absolutely. that sort of like a training alongside of the music? Yeah. I was going to ask, are people going to choose to say what particular thing they'd, they might like to work on to improve or something? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that if I'm imagining, like um, I can't, I, I can imagine the kind of things that I think would work, but obviously the idea is to do this. I mean, also I don't want to, um, I want to be careful not to kind of culturally appropriate 
um, you know, an ancient art of Aboriginal people. So I want to work with the Aboriginal people and with people with Parkinson's, which will have to be in Australia to start with. Oh, right. So this is the Australian actually with Aboriginals. I hadn't. Yes. Had that there. Wow. Um, because also in rural and regional um, Australia, there's an, an enormous prevalence of Parkinson's because of all the pesticides oh. and oh. hardly oh. any facilities. So it's a real problem basically, trying to get um, mm. any kind of um, intervention that's helpful for people. Oh. Like that. So that's so I'm hoping that by, by people creating their own musical stories, then they will just have something that they can access. And it really like the training program will be like people exploring how to do that for their own needs, but also within a group, because it is the, the social aspect that is so important. And so if you imagine like often the Aboriginal song lines tell a story of a journey and that will include some weather, for example, they will tell you what happened on the weather on the way from such a place to such a place. And so you could kind of use that in, in musical ways with mm -hmm. some people, if they want to work on smaller hand movements, could make like rain sounds on some kind of instruments and other people who wanted to do bigger movements could crash like a cymbal together to make a sort of lightning sound or other people could stomp or if people want to work on their voice they can use it in that kind of way so the, the point is that people can kind of contribute what they want so that it's beneficial to them but that you're doing yeah. a shared goal mm -hmm. yeah very good but, thank you thank you um i, did, I think uh, any more questions i think sam and i are sharing with this chair chair sharing and sharing i think sharing and sharing um, so are there any other questions? Because um, it's been really good. Thank you, Dawn. All, uh, all the way Janet from Switzerland. Has a question. Has Janet got a question? Have we got a question? Since we've been doing a lot of our dance classes online, so we're watching the teacher very, in a very focused way. I find that been really helpful. And I wonder if the music helps you to relearn the movement. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's... I think it is important to see somebody else moving because you can visually engage, but also actually the tactile experience of moving with someone is important. But yeah, it's really a multimodal sensory feed. Yeah. And you know, like it's, it's the, the idea of a compensatory mechanism is that, you know, if one thing's not gonna work, then we need to kind of, you know, like any circuit board, then we can always kind of, Maybe find another way to make it work. And this is what I really got from doing the PPI work. It's like not focusing on the stuff that you can't do, but focusing on ways of trying to find ways around stuff so that you can do things. And it might be a different way, but at least it's a way that you can do something. Thank you. Janet. Janet. Yes. Yeah. Um, like this is to do the, like the research project we do with patterns of perception. Yes. Yeah. I don't know whether you know about that, Dawn. Have you seen the, the, there was a small film made about a research project that Janet Knight took part in up at Central St. Martins and the Royal National, and the Na English National Ballet Company. Okay. Uh, I haven't seen that, no. It's on YouTube um, and the patterns of perception. Okay, lovely. I'll look at that. There is one um, type of neurological music, music therapy that hasn't yet been tried out in groups for people with Parkinson's and that's called pattern sensory enhancement. And that sounds like similar to what you are saying where you basically kind of attach different sounds or you make different sounds to different shapes of movement. Um, we, that's why it has to be a sort of integrated framework because those the music I've done a bit of training in neurologic music therapy since I've been here and it's very much about a one-to-one -one kind of working where like you're working one one very specific goal um, mm. but then that doesn't really have the nice social aspect of it so they used uh, the English National Ballet used the the choreography from the um, they done Giselle ah. and so we to that and then in the arts as well it was interesting because the Janet and I were in the same group that was put together and we did a lot uh, of our artwork which involved hands uh, a pattern of hands and apparently they said that the, the when they did the Giselle they had a wall of hands didn't they Janet yeah yeah, yeah. 
Oh, look that up, that sounds great. Are there any other questions? I don't, Anyone? I, I, yeah, don't, I, think... I don't have Parkinson's, but if I did and I wasn't able to move, I'm sure Country and Western would get me moving. The country and Western, yeah. <laughs> is that just me or is that everybody? I'm, I'm, I'm also I'm not a Parkinson's, I do not have Parkinson's, but again, I like you, I'm a great enthusiast of uh, country music. Yes. But don't we, yes. When you hear something like that, you want to get up and, and, and move, don't you? Or if you're just sitting, you kind of find yourself moving to it. <laughs> You escape your story in a way because you d you go into their story because country music is so much about storytelling. You forget your own and you become part of theirs. Yes. So, any, anyone else? Any more? Can, can I can I thank little, uh, anyone else before I stop? I just want to make a little statement if I can. Mm -hmm. We put off our celebratory birthday uh, dinner for June tonight. Mm -hmm. To, to watch you do it. Oh, no! <laughs> well, I, ho I hope it was worth it. <laughs> it certainly was. You're brilliant as normal. Oh, <laughs> that's brilliant. very, very kind of you, but none, none of it would happen without, with, without all of how much you welcomed me when I came to Hertfordshire and, and got involved and, you know, you made it happen as much as any of us. So, yeah. it works, works both ways. Anyway, you're now our first international superstar, so... <laughs> an international, we just had an international conference. Wow, aren't we good? <laughs> oh, thank you very much, Dawn. That was really good. And, and everybody remembers you, just remembers how, how open and, and accessible you are. So you obviously haven't become Swiss and closed. So that's good. Come home, Dawn. Come home. <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll, um, I'll send you the, 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 the slides if you like, and then all of those papers are all open access, so mm -hmm. everyone can, can get hold of them if they need to. And it's been really lovely seeing, seeing your lovely faces again, and also getting to see Lucy. Hi. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's been great. So thanks for inviting me. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for coming to us. It's lovely to see you again. I, I know I know Ruth I know Ruth was instigated Dawn by getting you to come and join this meeting here today and uh, I do thank you very much indeed if I can on behalf of everybody at the branch so thank you so much indeed for taking the time what are, are you two or three hours in front of us no only one hour just one hour oh it's not too bad then no. so I do, do thank you I so much like here actually I, I I know very little about Parkinson's I've become I think my, my learning curve is on the upright, but moving more across as, as, as the week, years and weeks and months go by. But all those rest of the uh, branch members, I'm sure have found your talk very, very fascinating. I found it interesting as well. Do thank you so much in time for all your time and putting to us. A lot of people you know, and when you're over, I look forward to having the opportunity of meeting you, if and when you do come over again. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'll be over as soon as they let us back in again. Ha, 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 ha.